Well, good morning, church. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to be able to uh, meet with you in this form, in this form of a way. We do thank the Lord for the means and the instruments that makes this possible. And so this morning we meet yet for, we meet for yet another um, uh, non-in-person or, or a distant service. Um, we're able to meet um, in this manner, and we thank the Lord that we're able to do so. Uh, we'll begin our service this morning as we usually do, um, but before we, we do that, uh, we do want to um, express our sympathies to the Vandeer and Gabriel family. Um, yesterday, uh, they received the news that uh, Robin Gabriel, um, he was with us last month in our services um, for a couple of weeks. They visited from Johannesburg and he was with us and spent some time with us um, in service and we went out for lunch and enjoyed enjoyed some fellowship together well yesterday we received the news that he succumbed to the to COVID-19 complications and passed away uh, in the hospital and so we do want to pray for the Gabriel and Vandia family and on behalf of the Reformed Church of Hout Bay we express our deepest and most sincerest condolences um, it's a reminder that we draw near to the Lord, that uh, this dreaded virus um, is indeed exposing our mortality and that we and our and our weakness as as human beings. But that we draw near to the Lord during these times, uh, and then also that we take the precautions that we have been asked to. Um, and so be reminded of this. Well, let's begin our time of worship with um, a call to worship. And our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm. 113 and we'll read from verse 1 praise the lord praise O servants of the lord praise the name of the lord blessed be the name of the lord from this time forth and forevermore from the rising of the sun to its setting the name of the lord is to be praised the lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens who is like the lord our god who is seated on high who looks far down on the heavens and the earth he raises the poor from the dust and lifts up the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes with the princes of his people he gives the barren woman a home making her the joyous mother of children praise the lord may the lord bless the reading of his word let's pray O oh God, we thank you this morning for yet another Lord's Day in which we are able to uh, find ourselves, O oh God, in this form, this undesirable, O oh Lord, yet we have much to be grateful for, form, O oh God. And so we do pray your blessing as we meet in this manner, as we are seated in front of um, various display screens, as we hear your word and as we listen to your word and uh, find ways to participate in the service. We do pray that you would give us grace to do this and help us, O oh God, as we may be surrounded by many distractions this morning, set our minds on you, set our hearts on you this morning, and may we be focused, O oh God, as we participate and as we hear and listen to the preaching of your word. O oh Lord, this morning in particular, we think of the Gabriel and Vander, your family, as they have suffered the loss of a loved one, O oh God. We um, remember this morning Robin Gabriel, and we do pray for his family, and we ask that you would comfort them at this time. We pray that you would strengthen them at this time. We pray for his daughter, and we do ask that you would be with her, O oh God, and draw near to her. We do thank you, O oh God, that you are our hope, and then, 
although we suffer in this world and suffer loss in this world, we do not mourn as those who are without hope. And so we do commit these families to you and ask that you would undertake for them, dear Lord. Thank you for your grace and your mercy toward us. Bless the service and the preaching of your word. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, we will join our hearts together as we sing our first and, and opening hymn, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. as we sing the praises of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, at this time, we turn our attention to the reading of Scripture, and I encourage you to pull your Bible next to you, open it with me to the passage that we'll be reading, and follow along as we hear the word of the Lord being read out. The Bible reminds us that man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so... This morning, we have yet another opportunity to hear God's word being read out aloud to us. And uh, with this, I encourage you to uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 32. We'll have an Old Testament reading and a New Testament reading. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 32, and we'll read from verse 1. Psalm 32, from verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. 
I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and brittle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. What a wonderful passage of scripture that reminds us of the comfort that we find in God. You are a hiding place for me, says the psalmist. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, we'll turn to our New Testament reading. And in your Bibles, I encourage you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll read from verse 1 through to verse 11. And this will be our New Testament reading this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. Another reminder of the importance and power, also the sufficiency of God's grace in the life of the believer. It enables us to serve him and work for him as we ought to. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, before we um, sing our second hymn, let's spend some time in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you this morning that we're able to hear your word being read out loud. We thank you, O God, that even where we find ourselves, we have your word coming to us, Lord. It is a reminder that though we are oftentimes bound, even now during a lockdown, even though we are oftentimes chained, O oh Lord, your word is not bound. Your word is not chained. Your word spreads, Lord. Your word goes forth, O oh God. And in your providence and sovereignty, you find ways, O oh God. You have ways, O oh Lord. You open doors for your word to proceed, O oh God. And so we give thanks this morning that we can be the recipients of the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, for your grace toward us, and we thank you for the forgiveness of sins that comes, O oh God, in the announcement and proclamation of the gospel. O oh Lord, we need your grace and we need the forgiveness of our sins, Lord, for, the, for we sin, Lord. We are tempted and we sin, O oh God. And this morning, we are mindful, O oh Lord, that... If we say we are without sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. And this is why we come before you and we acknowledge our sin to you. We confess our sin to you, Lord. And we ask that you would forgive us our sin. You promise forgiveness for those who trust in Jesus. You promise forgiveness of all our sins for those who lay their hope only in Jesus. And so we believe in Jesus. That's why your word promises us if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
And so lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, O Lord, as we look to you constantly and continually for grace, Lord, your grace which you so richly multiply toward us. Bless your people as we look to you. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we open up the scriptures and hear God's word together, uh, would you join me as we sing our second uh, hymn, God's Grace, Grace That Is Greater Than All Our Sin. in our time of singing. At this time, we open up God's word and we hear the preaching of the gospel. And so I encourage you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. And we'll continue to think on the topic that we have been for the last couple of weeks. And last week, we considered 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 1 through to 5. And today, I want, to look, I want us to look at the rest of this passage and think together on the matter of spiritual growth as we have been in the last couple of weeks. Like I said, it's the beginning of the year and we want to set ourselves some uh, resolutions and some goals and some targets and it's a good time to uh, consider doing this so that when it comes to the end of the year we can evaluate ourselves and examine ourselves as the Bible encourages us to do to see whether we have indeed grown. And so this is an important subject to think on. And so we'll continue to do that this morning. Well, I want us to read from 2 Peter chapter 1. And I want us to read from verse 3 to verse 11 this morning. And then we'll pray and we'll consider this passage together. 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory 
and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to, suppl to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way they will, they will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you this morning that we have your word open before us. And we do ask now that you'd open our hearts, that we would receive your word, that we would embrace your word, cherish your word that we would savor the truth that we hear this morning. We do pray that you open our minds, Lord, for comprehension, understanding, O oh Lord. We do pray that you open up our eyes, O oh God, that we'll see wonderful things in your word, that we will taste and see that the Lord is good. And so bless this time, Lord, as we give attention to the preaching of your word. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And so last week we, we looked at the grounds or reasons why we as believers can be encouraged to grow. And we considered this, of course, from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through to 4. And we noted last week that God has given us faith to believe in Him. He's given us all the same kind of faith, the same quality of faith, a like precious faith, a faith that possesses all the benefits for whosoever would believe and God has given us this faith, and it is this faith that enables us. It is this faith in Him, this faith in Him, that He is the object of our faith. This faith in Him that encourages us to grow. Without this faith, there can be no spiritual growth. And so we already as believers, we already as believers have this tremendous incentive to grow because we've been given faith. We've been caused to believe. Also, we noted last week that God has given us all things we need for godliness and life. So, so there was faith supplied and then there's also all things we need for godliness and life. We lack nothing. We lack no resource. We lack no, we lack no blessing. We lack nothing to grow up in our faith. Everything He has given us, the Word He has given us to feed on, prayer He has given us to draw near to Him, uh, the, 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 the means of grace to gather together with one another and be encouraged, um, the sacraments, the observance of baptism and the Lord's table, these are all means that grow us, that God has supplied for us. And so He has given us all things we need for godliness and life. And then also we, we noted last week that God has given us, God has allowed us to share in his nature. We are partakers of the divine nature. And so this week we'll be getting a reminder on how to grow. And, and that's very practical. And that's what Peter gives us from verse 5 onwards. A reminder on how to grow. Uh, Peter's intention here is to remind his audience of the truths that they know. And it is important, it's very important, and a very important part of Peter's purpose in writing that he reminds, that he rehearses these truths to the minds of his audience. After writing about how they must grow, he says to them in verse 12, For this reason I will not neglect to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth, Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. That's a wonderful ministry that Peter is embarking on. The ministry of reminding the saints of the precious truths of God's word. In fact, one of Peter's main aims in writing both his first and his second epistle is to remind believers of the gospel. 
He says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, This is now the second letter that I'm writing you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Peter says, this is the second letter I'm writing to you. And in both of these letters, my main objective is to remind you of the precious truths of the gospel. As one pastor notes, truth always needs repetition because believers easily forget. Truth always needs repetition. Truth always needs repetition because believers easily forget. It is important to be reminded of what we know and what we have learned for the sake of regular growing. Peter encouraged them to work hard and be diligent to add virtue upon virtue. In other words, to grow. Notice he says that those who do not grow have forgotten. Verse 9. They've forgotten. So forgetfulness of spiritual truths lead to spiritual decline. But remembrance of spiritual truths lead to spiritual growth. One commentator remarks and he says, A problem in many churches today is not that believers do not know what God expects of them, but that they either forget or are unwilling to live out the truth that they now have. You see, this may be difficult for many today because growth or advancement or excelling is often connected with the new, with the latest. We, we, we make that connection that in order for us to progress, we need something fresh. We need something new. We need some new insight. So you feel almost like you need to stay on the cutting edge of life. We see this in technology, right? For you to grow, you must keep up with the latest gadget, with the latest phone. For you to excel, for you to progress. When it comes to the modern and technological life, you always need the newest update. But, that, but what is true technologically is not true spiritually. Spiritually, we do not look for something new to grow, but we return to the truths we learned. For spiritual growth, we are reminded, uh, we remind ourselves of what we already know. And the unfortunate thing in many churches today is that believers feel unless there's some new move, some fresh move of God, uh, some, some latest or freshest anointing, Whatever that may mean, there can be no growth. However, Peter says, it is important that I remind you, even though you know this. It's important I remind you, and this is not limited to Peter. The Apostle Paul says the same thing to a church besieged by sin and immorality. He tells them in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Now I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Uh, Paul says, I know that there are many problems in this church, but one way to deal with these immoral things, one way to deal with the moral crisis and the doctrinal crisis that, just the, that the church in Corinth was facing is to remind the believers of the gospel truths. As believers, we are not in the business of the new, but the already we do not wait for a new word from God, but we have already received the word of God and we must learn it, know it, and importantly, we must be reminded of it. And therein we grow. The minister's task is set out chiefly, one would say, in rehearsing the gospel truths to the ears and the hearts of his hearers. Again this morning, I just want to highlight three points very quickly as we look at this passage together. Firstly, let's consider the manner in which we grow. The manner in which we grow. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge. Now, I want to draw your attention to those three words, make every effort. Make every effort. It, it, it literally means with seriousness and great zeal. Peter is asking his audience to grow. He is encouraging them to add virtue upon virtue, to stack up, if you will, spiritual excellence and spiritual virtues on top of each other in their hearts. And he wants them to do it in a particular way. He says, make every effort with seriousness and great zeal. So we approach growing in godliness. We approach the, 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 the pursuit of spiritual growth. We approach this with great zeal, brothers and sisters. We are not lackadaisical waiting for it to happen. We are not passive in our spiritual growth. 
No, we must make every effort to grow, to add. We must be zealous about this. Examine your own heart and think of the many things that excite you, that grip you, that move you. And ask yourself the question, if this prospect of growing in godliness excites you, moves you, and grips you, it must be pursued with great zeal. Make every effort. If, you, if not, you will not grow. Spiritual growth happens when we make an effort for it to happen. There, there, there's no strolling into spiritual growth. There's no passivity when it comes to spiritual growth. There's no lackadaisical nature when it comes to spiritual growth. It won't just happen. It must be worked for. We must make every effort to add virtue upon virtue. Peter gives us another manner in which we grow. Notice the verb used here. Add, supply, supplement. Now those are the three different English words to translate this Greek word. Supply, add, supplement. That's the word used here to tell us how to grow. We add virtue upon virtue. Now firstly, this word is, an, is written, or this verb, we should say, is written in the imperative mood. Which means when Peter tells his audience or his, uh, the believers, the brothers and sisters who will be reading this letter, when he tells them to supply virtue upon virtue, when he tells them to add to faith godliness and to add to knowledge um, uh, uh, brotherly affection, when he, when he asks of them to do this, he's not suggesting it. But and writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's commanding them to do this. He says, add in the imperative word. You must add. You must supplement. That's a very appropriate way to translate what Peter is saying. You must add. You must supply. You must supplement. In other words, not doing this is disobedience. And that's what I've been saying for the last couple of weeks. To fail to grow is disobedience. You won't just become more disobedient, but the very nature, the very absence of spiritual growth is a failure to obey God's word which commands us to grow I'm not presenting you to you this morning a great idea on spiritual growth or a great suggestion I'm presenting you the word of God through the apostle Peter that commands us to grow the word literally means make a lavish provision in other words we are to add virtue in great abundance to faith add goodness not a little bit of goodness but in abundance to godliness Add brotherly kindness, not a little bit of brotherly kindness, not enough to get by, but a lot. See, we, we, we often fall into that trap of just doing enough to get by. When you think about your life and the areas you would like to grow in, say, for example, it's brotherly love. Peter is commanding us here not to only add a little bit or enough to get by, but he says supply in great abundance. Love and grow in love. Be godly and grow in godliness. Uh, add goodness and may there be an abundance of goodness in your life. Add to these qualities. Grow in these graces. May there be a rich supply of these graces. And so that's the manner in which we ought to grow. We ought to make every effort and we must supply these virtues upon virtues. That's how we grow. It is a must for us to do this. And when we do this, we must do this with great zeal, brothers and sisters. Make every effort. Be zealous about your spiritual growth. And the second point I want us to consider is the virtues in which we grow. Not, not only the manner in which we grow, which we have just said now is to make every effort and to consider this as a commandment. Not only the manner, but secondly, the virtues in which we are to grow, the character in which we are to grow. Well, the first one, of course, as we note in verse 5, is faith. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And so the first blessing, the first virtue, the first grace we have is faith. Everything starts with faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so the one who comes must believe that he is and he is the rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Without faith, we cannot even be a Christian, no less grow as a Christian. And so faith is where the Christian life starts, when we trust in Jesus. Faith in Jesus is what separates Christians from all other people. 
It's a trust in the Savior which brings us into the family of God. This is the foundation of all other qualities and all other virtues in the Christian life. Faith lays the table upon which we sit every other grace, upon which we place every other blessing. Faith sets the table. Faith begins our Christian journey. As the pastor and theologian Mark Jones writes, he says, Living by faith means moving into the, real, into the realm whereby we are uncertain of ourselves, but more certain of God and His faithfulness. And that's a good way of thinking of faith. It's not, it sets us to the back and it casts us as um, not that important. And it brings God into the focus and into the forefront. Living by faith means that we are not so much certain about ourselves as we are about God and His faithfulness. To His faith, each believer should add, Peter says, the virtue of goodness. Virtue or goodness. That's what Peter says. Literally, moral excellence. Moral excellence. That's what we need to pursue to, aspire to. That when it comes to morality, that we are not just good enough, but when it comes to morality, that there be an excellence, a, a richness in our moral character. To faith supply goodness. That's what goodness means. Goodness means moral excellence. Now, now Paul unpacks this for us and spells it out for us very carefully in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. And if you want to understand what is meant by moral excellence, I submit to you that Philippians 4.8 has some wonderful explanation, uh, a wonderful explanation of what is meant by moral excellence. Paul writes there, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Again, I submit to you the characters, the graces, the truths, the virtues that Paul mentions there in Philippians 4, 8 is exactly what is meant by moral excellence. Moral excellence speaks of that which is true. Moral excellence speaks of that which is honorable. Moral excellence speaks of that which is just. Moral excellence speaks of that which is pure. Again, moral excellence speaks of that which is lovely and commendable. A moral excellence, in a sense, is anything worthy of praise. Anything worthy of praise. And so we have to add to our faith moral excellence. And so if you were to think about it, you have this table that is set by faith. And now comes all of these other graces. And the first of it is moral excellence. Paul says, dwell on these things. Peter says, grow in this. Add moral excellence to your faith and do so in abundance. The next grace that Peter says that we must add, if you look at verse 6 or verse 5, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge. And so we move on from virtue or goodness or moral excellence. We move on from, them and from that and we add knowledge. Knowledge comes not from intellectual pursuits in this regard, but it is a spiritual knowledge which comes through the Holy Spirit and it is focused on the Word of God. It is an inner, intimate knowledge that is occasioned by the taking in of Scripture, by the reading of Scripture, by the Word of God. No wonder Peter says in 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so we add to our table, decorate or, or, or set up by faith, we add to this table spiritual knowledge we must want to know we must want to know god we live in a world and we live in a christian world where we only want to feel and we only want to experience but brothers and sisters as important as it is to feel and as important as it is to experience we must also be a people who would want to know we must be for knowledge spiritual knowledge true knowledge we add to virtue, knowledge, faith, goodness, spiritual knowledge, though are not enough for a Christian's walk. The Christian must also make every effort, as we read further, to practice self-control and to knowledge, self-control. We add self-control to this. This means, and I find this is a very helpful explanation from one commentary, 
This means to have one's passions under control. To have one's passions under control. It is not necessarily the impugning of all passions as evil, nor is it the um, nullifying of passions in general, but it is the identifying of that which is legitimate and true desires and having it under control. Self-control. This means to have one's passions under control. It contrasts sharply with those who are loose in their lives, in their thinking, in their feeling, and in their talking loosely. A, a sense of anarchy or lack of control, which, which I suppose was there in the lives of the, the false teachers that Peter is opposing. And so in an increasingly loose society, Christians do well to let the music of self-control be played in their lives. Galatians chapter 5.22 tells us, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Do not be misled by the name self-control, because, but this is not because this is not a result of human effort. It's not a self-produced virtue. Self-control is a fruit of the spirit. Self-control is made possible by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And so, brothers and sisters, you can be self-controlled, not because you must control yourself, but because the Holy Spirit indwells you. He dwells inside of you, and He gives us the fruit. To be self-controlled. He gives us the ability to be self-controlled. And so we see not only knowledge but self-control. We move on from self-control and we see with self-control steadfastness or perseverance. As one commentator writes, believers living in the latter days, especially when surrounded by scoffers and false teachers, also need perseverance. The word means staying under it is frequently used in the New Testament to refer to constancy and steadfast endurance under adversity without giving up or giving in. That, that, that's what it means to be steadfast and to persevere. It means that there is pressure and you are staying under the pressure without giving in and without giving up. That's what it means to persevere. Staying under the pressure without giving up and without giving in. And that's what we must have. In this Christian life we must have faith we must have moral excellence we must have knowledge of God's Word we must be we must have self-control and we must have perseverance the ability the spiritually produced ability to stay up under trial also when we move on very quickly now godliness godliness it refers to piety or man's obligation to revere God, having a reverence for God. A one Bible commentator defines it as a very practical awareness of God in every aspect of life. That's godliness. Very helpful. Godliness is a very practical awareness of God in every aspect of life. The first five virtues we've just spoken of pertain to one's inner life in the relationship with God. The last two speaks about others, our relationship with others. Brotherly kindness means a fervent, practical caring for others. Brotherly kindness, a fervent, practical affection for others. See, our spiritual growth is not only toward God alone, but in it be, in, a, in as far as our spiritual growth is toward God, it is also toward others. Peter already urged this attitude on his readers in his first epistle. Brotherly kindness is what Peter seeking brotherly kindness first Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 9 we read now concerning brotherly love you have no need for anyone to write to you for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia but we urge you brothers to do this more and more see that there, there, there's never enough we can never be affectionate with one another enough we can never love enough we can never have a limit or, or draw or draw a line when it comes to our brotherly love our love for each other our love for one another must always overflow in fact john would say if we do this we demonstrate that we are children of god whereas brotherly kindness is a concern for others needs 
we find the last one, love, a desire for the highest good of others, says one commentator. This is the kind of love God exhibits towards sinners. Interestingly, this symphony begins with faith and it ends with love. Very appropriate. Building on the foundation of faith in Christ, believers are to exhibit Christ-likeness by supplying these seven qualities that climax in love toward each other. Brothers and sisters, here's the character we must grow in faith. We must grow in moral excellence. We must grow in knowledge. We must grow in self-control. We must grow in steadfastness. We must grow in godliness. We must grow in brotherly affection. And then finally, we must grow in love. These are the characteristics and the virtues we grow in. Allow me to conclude now by, notice, by, by listing the third point, the benefits in which we grow. The manner in which we grow, with great zeal. The characters in which we grow, well, these, but we looked at just now. And the benefits in which we grow, we'll see this in verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yet here we see there are two clear benefits in growing in godliness and Christ-likeness. You say, what benefits are there in growing? These two benefits would also count as reasons why you must grow. We see Peter giving it rightly in verse 8 to 11. The benefits in which we are growing or the benefits that come as a result of spiritual growth, growth is fruitfulness and assurance. Fruitfulness. As we grow, we become fruitful. We, we become Christ-like, not only in character, but also in service. We become useful as we grow. We become useful for God. We become useful in His work. We become useful in our lives and the character that we demonstrate. Fruitfulness. We're bearing good fruit. That's the benefit of spiritual growth. You are a healthy, growing, fruitful person. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so one can be unfruitful and unfruitfulness comes if we are not growing in these graces. One pastor writes and he says, Christian character is an end in itself, but it is also a means to an end. The more we become like Jesus Christ, the more the Spirit can use us in witness and service. The believer who is not growing is idle or barren or unfruitful. His knowledge of Jesus is producing nothing practical in his life. That must not be. The word translated idle also means ineffective. The people who fail to grow usually fail in everything else. People who fail to grow usually fail in everything else. Another pastor writes and he says, some of the most effective Christians I've known are people without dramatic talents and special abilities or even exciting personalities. Yet God has used them in a marvelous way. Why? Because they are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. They have the kind of character and conduct that God can trust with blessing. They are fruitful because they are faithful. They are effective because they are growing in their Christian experience. These beautiful qualities of character do exist within us because we possess the divine nature. We must cultivate them so that they increase and produce fruit in and through our lives. And so growing, brothers and sisters, makes us fruitful. Makes us fruitful. Fruitful and faithful. And the second benefit in growing spiritually is assurance. We have assurance. Second benefit in growing is that we gain assurance. We read that in verses 10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. There's a security. There's a spiritual security in spiritual growth. How do I become more assured of my salvation? Or well, grow in your salvation. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we grow, we receive assurance that we are born again and we know the Lord. It's not just those who say, Lord, Lord, but those who do the will of Him who is in heaven. And God's will is that we be born again believers and growing believers. How do I know I'm saved? How do I know I'm secured? Are you growing in godliness? Is there development in your spiritual life? Do you see yourself changing as you draw nearer to Christ in His Word and in prayer? If you cannot answer yes to these questions, you need to go back to the beginning. Believe in Jesus as your Savior and Lord and trust Him to forgive you, change you and grow you. Where there is no spiritual growth, there is good reason to question whether there is spiritual life, says one pastor. William Webster writes and he says, In light of the sober possibility of profession without possession, the New Testament exhorts us to examine ourselves. And so examining ourselves, how, when we examine ourselves, when we test ourselves to see if we are in the faith, what we need to be finding and discovering is spiritual growth. Is spiritual growth. You cannot, as a professing believer, go year in and year out unchanged. That's the message that I'm, that's basically summed up in one sentence for the last couple of weeks. We cannot, we cannot, as professing believers, go year in and year out without a commitment to change. The manner in which we grow, we make every effort to supply in rich abundance, virtue upon virtue. The character in which we grow, seven clear virtues listed by Peter. The benefits in which we grow, or the benefits that comes from growth, fruitfulness and assurance. May the Lord bless you as you think on these things. We'll pray now, and after that, immediately end our Lord's Day service. Thank you for listening. And have a wonderful and blessed Lord's Day. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you this morning for your word. And we thank you for teaching us through your spirit the truth of your word. Thank you for reminding us, oh God, oh, how important it is that we be reminded as we forget so easily. Thank you for reminding us of these truths, Lord. Thank you for encouraging us, Lord, and for opening up to us, oh God, the way to grow. Maybe our minds have been blocked by various obstacles, imaginary obstacles, real obstacles. But thank you for reminding us this morning that it is still possible and you still will for us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so help us as we set out this year to grow up. Help us as we set out this year to supply, to supplement, to add to our faith moral excellence, to moral excellence knowledge to knowledge, goodness, to goodness, self-control, to self-control, oh Lord, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly affection and love. For if we possess these qualities, we won't be idle, ineffective, and unfruitful. And we will have assurance that we know you, we love you, and we are known by you, and you love us, and there awaits for us entrance into your eternal kingdom. And so bless your people now. Bless this day as we ask you these mercies in Jesus' name. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of His Spirit rest and abide with all God's people until we see Him face to face. And everyone says, Amen and Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a wonderful day.